Hello again, everybody. I'm Chris Mooneyham, and welcome to the TCA All Sports Report. As always, brought to you by Fox 5 Atlanta, 680 The Fan, and of course, the Touchdown Club of Atlanta. Thanks for joining us, everyone, for the uh, final week of March, or the first week of April, depending, of course, upon when you're watching this week's All Sports Report. And this week's All Sports Report will talk about the beginning of the spring championship seasons across the state of Georgia. Also, a very pivotal time for the state of Georgia as far as its rules committee and rules go, the amendments to the uh, GHSA athletic constitution. It is, of course, time, as it is every year, for the GHSA executive committee to meet for their spring meetings. And now the agenda has been released. And if you take a look at that agenda, you'll find many very topical, I'll say, subjects as far as reaching back into some of the big storylines that we've seen across the state of Georgia over the last, well, not just this season, but really over the last year, the GHSA going to address some of those big-time subjects. Transfers, as far as private and public school transfers. We all know the story of Demetrius Robertson uh, down at uh, Savannah Christian. They're going to talk about uh, 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 clock management. They're going to talk about potentially paying a third party to come in and officiate the scorebook and the score clock, uh, uh, the, the clock and the scoreboard. We all know about Swainsboro and Holy Innocence during the uh, boys' state basketball playoffs. So again, the GHSA has released their agenda, and they're going to talk about uh, some of the pertinent subjects that we've all been talking about across Georgia high school athletics. And I must implore you to stay tuned for the Ever Wonder portion of our program. Brad Walsh has done some yeoman's work this week. Our resident historian from the TCA has revealed to us one of the great traditions in all of Georgia high school football, how Woodward Academy came to uh, instill one of their great traditions. And it came, well, with the help of one of their arch rivals. All of that coming up here in the TCA All Sports Report. But first, let's find out what's happening across the Empire State of the South. Well, first things first, let's make sure that we get our, our, uh, our business in order here. Uh, the final two weeks of the tennis regular season coming up. Uh, so every year there, it's, it feels like the same eight to ten dynasties of, uh, of high school tennis here in the state of Georgia dominate. And then you've got this really large pack of programs that are battling inside of that second tier to potentially be the upset team of the tournament. Those teams now with their shot to really solidify themselves over the last two weeks of the tennis regular season. And of course, that'll kind of uh, help break the seal uh, for our spring championship season. We've talked about it a lot here on the All Sports Report over the last couple of years. Uh, the month of May is this wild and woolly championship month. This is when it really starts to get ramped up as we start to get into the first week of April. It'll start with a slow trickle, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, we'll have four or five sports that will be at the end of the regular season, smack dab in the middle of their playoffs, and at the same time, other sports will be crowning their state champions. That seal is truly broken this week with the 2015 GHSA State Riflery Championships down at the Fort Benning Military Complex in Columbus. The Pool International Shooting Complex, to be precise, is the home for the 2015 championships. And it's really a historic championship this year. You've got some of the great decorated programs in Georgia's riflery uh, state championship history like Northside of Columbus and uh, Woodward Academy. And then you've got the last three state champions. All three of those programs are coming back this year. Alatoon is the defending state champion. They'll be joined by Union Grove and Lumpkin County. Again, Lumpkin and Union have both won titles in the last three years. Alatoon are the defending state champions. Northside Columbus Warner, uh, and, and, and um, Woodward Academy two of the most decorated programs in this state's history. They'll be joined by uh, programs like Tiff County, Ware County, East Coweta, uh, Lee County, Harrison, Stockbridge, Columbus, and then the two invites, not the automatic qualifiers, but the two uh, invites go to Gainesville and Parkview. Admission is free to the 2015 GHSA Riflery State Championships, but of course, remember, you'll want to go to ghsa.net for further details, or you can go to Fort Benning's website, because after all, it is a military complex. Some rules have changed over the last few years as far as being able to get onto the base um, any base across America, or really across the world uh, for that matter, but I digress. You know what I mean. You'll need to make sure that you've got all the necessary identification 
to get into the Fort Benning Complex. Again, April 4th is the date. At the Pool International Shooting Complex, it's the 2015 GHSA State Riflery Championships in Columbus at the Fort Benning Military Complex. GHSA.net for further details. Coming up next in the Ever Wonder portion of our program, have you ever wondered what one of the great rivalries in the state of Georgia's football history had to do with one of the great traditions in Georgia's high school football history. Well, Woodward Academy has that tradition, but they didn't necessarily start the tradition, or at least they didn't have the first words in that tradition. It's next in Ever Wonder. You know, there's an old saying that men love to tell stories. Men talk about the weather, and women talk about men talking about the weather. Well, if men aren't talking about the weather, they're talking about sports. And one of the things that we love about talking uh, about sports history is that so often when you got a group of guys that are sitting down talking about a great moment or great team or great player in sports history, I can offer a portion of the story. Someone else can offer a different portion of that story. And yet someone else can offer another portion of that said story. That is what we love about sports history. And that's why this week when I received the article from Brad Walsh, our resident historian for the Touchdown Club of Atlanta, I was absolutely giddy. And yes, I mean to use the word giddy <laughs> when I saw the subject of this week's Ever Wonder portion of the program because it was about one of the great rivalries in Georgia high school football history. You can't help, as a 22-year veteran, as I am of Georgia high school football broadcasting, you can't help but know a good deal about the history in this state. It's connected. There's no way around not learning about the history of Georgia high school football in this state if you're going to be a broadcaster. And so most of us play-by-play -play guys, we know about the history of Woodward Academy versus Marist in the late 70s and early 80s. These two programs met, I think, nine times over a five-year stretch, and three times the two programs went on to reach the state championship game, or actually more precisely, four times. But we'll get into that in just a moment. A byproduct of that rivalry, one of the great in this state's history in such a short time span, the byproduct was also one of the great traditions in this state's history. Woodward Academy, remember, is a very old, old school. Started as the Georgia Military Academy in 1900. Changed their name to Woodward in 66 when they dropped the military uh, emphasis. Throughout its 100 year of football history, they've played just about anybody and everybody they could play across the region, across the state, of course. But the only really constant rival throughout that time has been Marist, whom they first played in 1922. Starting in 1976, as I mentioned, it was the beginning of this incredibly intense rivalry between two teams that in any given year were arguably the best teams in their state, uh, in the state, in their respective classifications. In 1976, the two teams, region rivals at this point, met early in the regular season. That would be the storyline from 76 through 79, region rivals meeting early in the season and meeting late in the season. I'll get to it in a second. So in week two, the two teams meet, and Marist comes away with a three-point victory. But a one-point victory to Woodward happened in the region final. That would knock Marist out of the state playoffs and propel Woodward onto the state championship game, which they would go on to lose, by the way, to Avondale High School. 1976, the rivalry amps up a little bit. Woodward would sweep Marist in the regular season and to, re, uh, to secure the region title and again end Marist's season. Then it really becomes a rivalry because in 1978 Marist flipped the script and swept Woodward, beat him in the regular season early and beat them in the region final. 1979 now, Woodward would beat Marist in week two but Marist would win 17 to seven in the region final ending Woodward's season. Marist would go to the state championship game where they would lose a state championship game that they're still talking about, by the way. They would lose to Redan High School by just three points. That's a whole nother subject for the All Sports Report and the Ever Wonder portion of the program, that great championship game between Redan and Marist in 1979. But anyway, then came 1980. 
the biggest year in question, the biggest year of the rivalry. By this time, the school, the players, the fans, the student body, obviously the administration, the, the, the city, really, and the state knew about the rivalry between Marist and Woodward Academy. Woodward would enter their regular season matchup ranked number three in the state. That was their only scheduled meeting. The two teams were no longer in the region. They were just playing each other in a regular season early matchup because they were rivals. Marist would come out with the 20-14 upset victory with a last-second touchdown against the number three team in the state. And Woodward was absolutely stunned because Marist was, quite honestly, supposed to be down a little bit that year. That win would propel Marist on for the rest of that 1980 season. But it left a bitter, bitter taste in the mouth of the Woodward Academy program, not just because of the loss, but what happened later on after the ball game during the week. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the sports section, of course, covered that ball game because it was one of the bigger ball games across the state, if not the biggest game across the state that weekend. And senior linebacker and fullback Jeff Ogletree was interviewed regarding the ball game and quoted in the article as saying, I felt after the first play of the game like we were going to win. Quite a bold statement. He then went on to say, we just seemed to want it more than they did. We just seemed to want it more than they did. Those last nine words punched Coach Hickson and his Woodward Academy team uh, in the gut. Really, really hit them where it hurt because obviously that's a shot at your pride is really what that is. What it did for Woodward, not only did that win propel Marist on to a tremendous successful season, but it also really lit a fire under Woodward's tush and pushed them all the way to the state championship game. So Woodward gets to that state title game. They look, get onto the sidelines, they look across the field, and who do they see? But Marist. That's right, you can't write this script. Woodward Academy and Marist met each other in 1980 for the state championship. So Coach Hickson knew that he wanted to do something to try to fire up his Woodward club. So he went out, found an old wooden plank, pulled out his pocket knife, and he took that nine-word quote from Ogletree, we just seemed to want it more than they did. And he carved it into that wooden plank. He then bore holes in the plank, took a little rope or a, or, or a heavy string, put it through there, and put it around his neck. And Coach Hickson wore the plank around his neck for the state championship game. Well, Marist jumped out to a 10-0 lead halfway through uh, that first half, but Woodward would come back with 14 unanswered points and then come up with a goal line stand late in the ball game where some of the student body and players were loosely quoted as saying, we just wanted it more. We just wanted it more. Today, that wooden plank still hangs as Woodward Academy players come out onto the field as a moment of motivation. They did that at the beginning of the 81 season, promptly went out to, uh, to uh, the locker room or the field house or wherever they have it hanging and put it right out there. And again, it still hangs on the locker room above the exit to this very day. Coming up next, in the What's Next portion of our program, we take an early look at the 2015 GHSA Executive Committee's Spring Meetings. Very, very excited about what we've got coming up on Monday, April 13th, uh, down in Macon. It's the Spring GHSA Executive Committee Meetings. They release the agenda usually two, three weeks before the meeting, and I'm really, really excited about what they're going to be talking about this year. Uh, I'm going to talk about these meetings in various sections of the All Sports Report over the next three weeks. We'll take it in What's Next this week. We'll take it in uh, My Take next week, our last portion of the program, and we'll take it in What's Happening in the opening portion of our program after the meeting. Kind of give you a recap if we're able to. How much of a recap, I don't know, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that if we have to as well uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. But what's important, I wanted to give you a little preview of what they're going to be talking about. There's a proposal to require a host school to provide a paid adult hired by the school or school district to maintain the official scorebook and electric clock slash scoreboard 
at all basketball games. Of course, I don't want to delve too much into each one of these subjects. I'll save that for next week when I'll give you my opinion on each one of these big subjects. But, of course, as we all know, that has a lot to do with the Holy Innocence Swainsboro Boys uh, basketball game uh, that happened this year where Swainsboro was given an extra point when they shouldn't have been. Of course, that game ended regulation tied. They went into overtime. You can't just out and out say Holy Innocence would have won the basketball game because you never know how the uh, the strategy at the end of the ball game would have unfolded with Swainsboro having one less point. But there is no question, obviously, that's a major mistake that was made and affected the outcome of the ball game when you give somebody an extra point in an overtime ball game. I digress. Again, we'll talk about that later next week, but that's a very important subject, and that's what I'm really happy about in seeing the agenda for the spring meetings. They're really talking about topical subjects this year, including a proposal to consider modifying bylaw 2.64A2, which prohibits teams from entering national championship tournaments after the season's end, of course, that being in basketball, and of course, that referenced the whole Wheeler situation, which we haven't talked about here on the All Sports Report. Again, I'll talk about it, give you my opinion on that more later. I think that's an absolutely ridiculous rule. I understand the whole reason for it is for the safety of the kids, to get them back into the classroom. You don't want to overwork the kids, but, you know, look, not every year will, the, will there be a team in the state of Georgia that can go play in the national championships in an eight-team field across the country in New York City. So anyway, uh, there's also uh, a, a proposal uh, in regards to the Demetrius Robertson situation last year where he was trying to transfer from, um, from one school to the next. There's this very convoluted rule between transfers of private to private. When there's a public school you could be going to, the student's enrolled in a private school or a magnet school and has a bona fide move from one public school service area to another public school service area. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I read it, because it's just that confusing. There's also a proposal to increase the number of baseball games allowed during the regular season from 26 to 36. I have a very strong opinion on this one. Surprisingly, actually, I think I'm going to go uh, against uh, the grain on this one and go the way you may not expect me to go. They're also talking about moving the state championship games in baseball in all classifications to a uh, neutral site, a centralized location. Love, love, love this idea. Absolutely love this idea. Uh, but again, I'll give you my opinions with more girth, with more fire coming up next week in the My Take portion of our program. But that, just a sample of some of the big time subjects they're going to be talking about down at the GHSA Spring Executive Committee meetings. Again, Monday, April 13th at the Marriott Macon City Center in Macon. Coming up next in the My Take portion of our program, the state of Georgia, some people have been saying that basketball, the talent level, was down this year. I beg to differ. There are so many media outlets now in this state. Georgia, of course, being such a large state, so large landmass-wise, city-wise, population-wise, that there are so many media outlets that cover our Georgia high school athletics. So many of those media outlets come out with their all-state teams for all of the respective sports, but especially in the big sports, football, basketball, and baseball. And, of course, many people would say that football's one, basketball two, and baseball is three. Now, we talked about that a little bit last week as we, uh, as we talked about uh, the baseball, uh, about baseball in the state of Georgia, I should say. And, and, and I was very quick to remind people that the state of Georgia churns out as much Major League Baseball talent per size of the state, per population, as just about any other state across the country. And really, if you were to rank the states, it's the same thing you do in football, baseball, and basketball. Really, the state of Georgia is churning out top five talent in all of those major three sports. I've heard a lot of chatter this year about how the talent level for basketball in the state was kind of top heavy. And then after that, there's a big time drop off. And even the top level talent, not quite as good as it has been in the past. The all state basketball selections have been released by the AJC. Now, I, I release a lot of different rankings and, and, and things of this nature. I decided not to do this year my state basketball 
All-State team because there are so many media outlets that do this. But this year's list further cements an opinion that I've had all year, which differs from those other opinions that I was just mentioning, that the talent level is down. As I've mentioned all year, the, the, the depth of, this, of the talent in this state is really, really underrated. Have there been better years at the top? Sure. Uh, has there been better depth? Maybe, maybe. But this year's talent base is clearly better than people suspect. The AJC, first of all, named Jalen Brown as its all-classification player of the year. No qualms with that. Barely even going to talk about it. This kid's an NBA player right now. I promise you, next year, if he went straight to the NBA, Jalen Brown would average 12-7. and 7. I really, really believe that. And I think in five, six, seven, eight years, Jalen Brown is going to be a 22-11 and 11 guy. Okay, that's not where I want to use my example. I want to use the example to articulate my point in the depth of the first team All-State teams. You understand what I mean? First of all, we have our, our classification player of the year. And then you have the rest of the guys that are in that first team. When you look at the guys that are on the first team that could have been players of the year, that's when you start to really realize, man, oh man, this classification was actually pretty deep this year at the top. Really, that's the way to make the point. After the players of the years, the names of the young men who did not win their player of the year inside of a classification is really quite stunning. Names like Ty Hudson of Pebble Brook, because of course Jalen Brown was the player of the year in the 6A classification. Ty Hudson easily, if not for Jalen Brown, could have been the player of the year in the 6A classification. Alterique Gilbert, who's been a four-year starter at Miller Grove, one of the great leaders on one of the great championship teams in our state's history, was not the player of the year in the 5A classification. It was Turner, the kid out of Brunswick. Tracy Hector Jr. from Jonesboro was not the player of the year. Of course, who was it? Well, it was MJ Walker, his teammate at Jonesboro. Malik Ben Levy of Jenkins was not the player of the year. William Jarrell from Crawford County. And, and don't even get me started on 2A. That was 3A and, and, and 2A. Don't even get me started on 1A. You literally had three other guys on the first team just on the first team that could have been the single-A classification players of the year. Uh, uh, Turtle, ja uh, Turtle Jackson uh, from, uh, from Athens Christian, uh, Kobe Jordan Simmons from St. Francis, and Justin Ravenel from Green Forest Christian all could have been first team players of the year, of course. Uh, that went to uh, Beasley from St. Francis, who's going to Florida State. And, and a reminder, each All-State uh, boys and girls team uh, that the AJC released, who I personally believe uh, releases the best of the All-State teams out of all the publications. No offense to anybody else, uh, especially since I didn't release any this year. <laughs> I'm only kidding, but that is my take. But uh, anyway, uh, you can go to AJC.com. It's currently up on their high school sports page, and you can see the guys and girls All-State teams. Okay, coming up next week. Another jam-packed show. We'll talk about the Rifle Championships. We'll talk more about the spring GHSA executive meetings. And we'll get you ready for more playoffs coming up across the state of Georgia. All that more coming up next week on the TCA All Sports Report.